Welcome back into the Lions 24-7 podcast and welcome into the infirmary ward that is my household this week. Everybody's got COVID. My nine-month-old daughter, my wife, myself. Unfortunately, that means I will not be at that camp that we talked about last episode, Penn State wrapping up their prospect camp uh, this weekend. Uh, Friday, camp coverage on Lions 24-7 coming your way. Tyler Calvaruzzo is making the trip up here. A couple of our teammates, uh, Mark Brennan and Daniel Gallen, quickly transitioning to the recruiting trail after spending a few days out in Indianapolis for the Big Ten Media Days. They will be on the field on Friday. So we're well covered. It's great to have awesome teammates. I'll be following along from home, probably drinking Pedialyte, watching a mix of Sesame Street and Disney Plus with my daughter. But to bring in some experts on what we just saw take place out in Indy, let's go to Daniel and Mark here on the podcast. Guys, I know it's been a whirlwind week for you, and I know you've got camp coverage coming up this afternoon. So thanks for fitting in some podcast time on a Friday morning. Yeah, definitely. It was an interesting week, um, and I think this is going to be kind of the new normal uh, in terms of uh, travel. We were just getting ready to leave on Monday, driving down to Baltimore to catch our flight to Indy, and didn't make it past the Shaner Field out near the Harley dealership when we got a notice that our Southwest flight was canceled and couldn't get out until the following morning. So Daniel and I decided to drive to Indianapolis, which was actually, you know, it wasn't that bad. So we got to talk a lot, a lot of Penn State football, a lot of personal stuff, uh, then driving back. Uh, so kind of a crazy few days. But uh, as I said, you know, I think the way things are, you know, we're going to have to be able to think fast and, and, and change things with, you know, who knows who might come down with COVID? Who knows when flights might be canceled? But that's kind of the way things have to go. And the bottom line was we were able to get out there. And uh, I had a lot of fun. Uh, I always enjoy that event. And obviously, it was very informative. Yeah, it's, yeah. It sounds, it's, Daniel, it sounds like if you didn't know Mark all that well quite yet from working together for a couple of months, you do now after that road trip with him. And um, it's been a mad scramble of a week behind the scenes here at Lions 24-7 because of some of the things you mentioned. But the content was great coming out of Indy. And one thing that stood out to me early on in your coverage, and I think to a lot of Penn State football fans and Penn State athletics fans out there, was your interactions with Pat Kraft. And we'll start with you, Daniel, on that one, because you wrote a story, of, of, and we'll talk about football a lot in a moment, but you talked about how this really seems like it lines up as a fighter for James Franklin, an advocate for James Franklin. And these were all the kind of stuff that Franklin was not so subtly alluding to when his contract negotiations were taking place and Penn State needed a new athletic director last season. Definitely. We got, I think, close to 20 minutes with Pat Kraft on Wednesday uh, after James Franklin finished up at the podium. Um, and while he was at the podium, James Franklin made that uh, passing reference to the fact that Penn State was opening Big Ten play uh, on the road for the, the ninth straight year, I believe, um, at Purdue on September 1st. Um, and then uh, Mark went and asked Pat Kraft about it. And Kraft said it stinks, and he addressed it head on, said he'd already called the Big Ten Conference about it um, and that it was something that shouldn't happen to Penn State. And then later, uh, James Franklin was asked about having that kind of AD who is willing to be that public about things, willing to, to stick up uh, for the program about things like that. And James said that it's great to have a fighter. Uh, it's great to have someone who's pounding the drum in all these different areas because it lets Franklin kind of take a step back. Um, and focus on his program and maybe not have to do kind of the as many, I guess, political things as he might he felt like he might have had to in the past. So uh, it was really interesting. Pat Kraft, obviously a dynamic speaker, uh, a very engaging personality. Uh, he's, I think when he came in, he was regarded as emotional and fiery. And that was that was on display uh, while we were uh, chatting with him uh, in Lucas Oil Stadium. Yeah, we had covered a up. Yeah, um, I was going to throw it right to you, Mark, because you've covered a few regimes and you've you've seen plenty of leadership styles here at Penn State. What's your earlier impressions as as we are in 29 days into this uh, Pat Kraft era? Well, you know, I, I just think it's a different it's it's a different era than, um, you know, number one, when when James Franklin took over, they were obviously transitioning from a very difficult time in the program's history. Uh, you know, Bill O'Brien was here under a. Uh, temporary athletic director who I wasn't exactly very high on, but the guy did hire James Franklin, which I think was a great hire and he did hire Bill O'Brien. So I thought both of those things were pretty well for Dave Joyner. And then prior to that, obviously the face of the program and Penn state was Joe Paterno for all those years. I mean, he was, Joe was actually the athletic director himself in the early eighties. 
And from that point on, he turned it over to Jim Tarman and then Tim Curley. But you knew who was calling the shots. I mean, you know, you knew who was the guy in the athletic department and that can't happen anymore. So I think what James Franklin was getting at is that a football coach has to focus on so many different things now. And we all know James Franklin well enough. And I don't mean this in a negative way, but he micromanages his program. You know, he's a CEO of his program. He has to worry about every single detail. And he can't be the guy who's worrying about complaining about, and I think it's opening in seven of the last nine that uh, they, they were at, they, they, uh, they had one, I think, home game in there uh, during that stretch. But regardless, um, the numbers are ridiculous. I don't know that it's a, it's, you know, some, some folks on the, uh, on our site actually did some digging in and came up with some data that, that indicates it's really not that big of a deal, but it's more the principle th of the thing. It's the look of the thing. When you see Penn State on the road to start all these years, and then, you know, the last couple of years, you're at Wisconsin and you're at Purdue. I mean, to start the entire season, that, that's tough stuff. So I think to have that sort of advocate now, that allows James Franklin to focus on his program, to focus on uh, recruiting, to focus on, you know, what he needs in facilities, to focus on, you know, who knows what kind of coaching turnover there's going to be, the transfer portal, all of these things are there. And so college football, you're at a point now where you need an athletic director who's going to go to the mat for you. And, I, you know, I, I don't think it's any coincidence that, um, that, that Pat Kraft ended up being the guy because he's known as somebody who's a dynamic personality, who's not afraid to get out after it. And anybody who was following our board probably had a little sneaking suspicion that he might go off. And, and we might have had a little sneaking suspicion that he might go off on that whole uh, Big Ten road opener thing. Yeah, he you now he James Franklin, the players, they get on the, that plane with a game plan when they go out to Indianapolis. And it seems like it's mission accomplished for Pat Kraft and trying to get the message out. Something you wrote about was that streak of of Big Ten road matchups to start the season, seven straight seasons, including this year, 12 of, of 13 years in conference matchups and the 2023 Big Ten opener scheduled to take place at Illinois next September 2024 Big Ten opener as of now. At Rutgers. So it is a theme, but 2024 is going to get blown up because of what's going to happen to this conference. But fellas, before we move on from Pat Kraft, um, you know, and, and just generally the conversation about where football, where college athletics are heading, how these leaders are trying to deal with it. There was uh, an interesting, you know, obviously nugget, a bombshell, whatever you want to phrase it. Uh, and however much you're into kind of thinking it's a huge deal. Sean Clifford, you know, was contacted uh, by a player association rep, uh, leader there and uh, a, a guy who has certainly come under some scrutiny. I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole in this discussion, but uh, you know, it's kind of a, a divisive topic and one that Sean Clifford wasn't going to discuss and it certainly didn't seem like James Franklin wanted to open up on that. But Franklin, Kraft, what can you kind of read between the lines without a lot of things being discussed explicitly about you know the unionizing phrasing that was discussed uh, coming out of this meeting? Well, to, to me, and sorry, Daniel, but yeah, uh, what I got out of it, and the one thing that Sean Clifford said is that it's good to be, it's good for him to be in a position where his head coach, his athletic director, and the commissioner of the Big Ten. Kevin Warren are willing to have those honest conversations about these things. Now, what were those exact conversations? We don't know when we're never going to know that's that those were the things that they would not talk about, but that's the important part of it. I mean, you can't stick your head in the sand. If you're a coach administrator uh, or conference commissioner, especially a conference of the prestige and uh, th that's uh, in the kind of public spotlight as much as the Big Ten. If you're a Big Ten athlete and a, a starting quarterback at a high-profile Big Ten team and you're involved in NIL stuff or, you know, potential unionization, um, there's going to be a lot of eyeballs on you. That just goes without saying. So that is why it's critical for the coaches, administrators, and commissioners to have honest conversations about this. And, you know, it, it's it, the one thing that I asked, asked Sean is, I mean, listen, you, 
if if you're going to be kind of a a, a face of some of, of this NIL stuff, can you really expect to shut it off during the season? Can you really expect to not get questions and stuff about it? Absolutely. And I, I think he does. I, I think he thinks that you can compartmentalize, but I think that's going to be more difficult than he thinks. Uh, and I'm not being negative. I'm just saying that if, if you choose to do that, if you choose to be one of those faces uh, of the NIL movement, and I applaud him for doing that. And I think we all realize that wherever Sean Clifford lands in life, he's going to be very successful in what he does because he's a very smart guy. But the one thing I'd be a little bit nervous about is can you really like he was saying, hey, we're five days out from camp. Yeah, but Sean, that, it, this stuff doesn't just get shut off during the season. There's still going to be discussions about it, and you are still going to be asked about it. And now, now whether he can just maintain, I'm not talking about it during the season. I guess we'll see. Yeah, I thought that Clifford's kind of uh, his his standard line was, we're, we're five days away from camp. I'm excited for that. Uh, Purdue is on September 1st. I'm looking forward to that. Um, he didn't really want to. He said he was there to talk about football. Um, obviously, kind of like Mark said, during the season, this this NIL stuff is going to come up. Um, it's part of the game now. So, and I think that it's something that you have to kind of keep talking about. Um, even if you look at it from the player perspective um, of being kind of a brand promoting things, like you can't be like, you can't go to the brands and be like, all right, I'm shutting it down. The season's starting. Um, you know, this is kind of an, an ongoing thing. So it'll be interesting to see kind of that balance as we go forward. But in terms of kind of the, the overall big picture of um, of this issue and, and some of the things that had come out before Big Ten Media Days, I thought that uh, Pat Kraft framed it kind of interestingly about how when he was a player at Indiana, you never would have thought about talking about this stuff if you were a player that it would have been pretty taboo and that it never would have crossed his mind. But he acknowledged that things are different now and you have to be willing to be open, uh, to have communication and have an open dialogue between coaches, players, administrators uh, to kind of know what's going on. So I think it'll be interesting to see where this goes. Um, both James Franklin and Pat Kraft reiterated that they were proud of Sean for having these conversations to kind of you know, being interested in these types of things. Um, but during his opening statement uh, or during his press conference, Kevin Warren um, was asked about player revenue sharing and uh, or sharing revenue with players. And I think that these conversations and this topic, especially with UCLA and USC coming into the conference with this big uh, media rights deal coming up and with some of these things that were kind of thrown around like healthcare uh, in the long term. Um, I think that this stuff is kind of just getting started and it's going to come up uh, whether or not Sean Clifford only wants to talk about football or not um, over the next few months. Well, that obviously, and by the way, it always seems like we have so much, so many serious things to talk about with Sean Clifford. Initially, you know, he got his job when Tommy Stevens transferred out, and it was kind of an interesting scenario that played out there. And then, obviously, the offensive coordinator changes that have occurred, and what happened in 2020 and transpired there, and kind of two seasons in one last year with, with how things played out. Um, there's always plenty to talk about uh, with Sean Clifford and about Sean Clifford, but a couple other guys were out there uh, alongside him, two other uh, leaders on this team and perceived team captains when those are announced later on in August. Jair Brown, uh, safety, and then defensive tackle P.J. Mustafer. Let's start with the great news that P.J. Mustafer is on track to be with this team next week on the field for preseason camp. As noted several times out in Indianapolis, passed his final conditioning test as a Penn State athlete. Got a chance to celebrate that with a massive dinner. Um, fellas, let's start with PJ, because not only is he to have that gregarious personality and, and kind of an ownership of this locker room in some ways, but man, he was very, very good last year for those first six games. And he'd be in an NFL training camp right now if he had stayed healthy. Yeah, I think he, uh, I, I think, people are sleeping a little bit on, on the impact that he's going to have, you know, when you're out at big 10 media days, you get the opportunity to just, you know, frat, fraternize and, and, and BS with a bunch of other beat writers from, from different teams. And obviously, uh, you know, we had time to spend some, some real quality time with a lot of the 24 seven experts from the different sites who are out there. And nobody's really talking about PJ Mustafer and, um, I think that's a little bit of a mistake because people forget, as you mentioned, Tyler, 
that he was playing at an extremely high level. I think even though he only played in, you know, five point, whatever, you know, 5.2 games, whatever, however much he played in that, in that Iowa game, what he was still a second or third team, all big 10 pick, which is, which to me, you know, says something when you play less than half the season, you know, the thing that, that jumped out to me is, you know, everybody was kind of having fun with him passing the conditioning test. You know, uh, Daniel Daniel can speak to this as well. Uh, obviously, PJ was very proud, and Jair, Tig, and uh, Clifford. Outside of talking about NIL, that was the thing they talked about most. They just kept saying over and over, like the biggest thing of the summer was PJ passing his conditioning test. But when Franklin addressed that. He said, yeah, people are having some fun with this, but it is a big thing for a big man coming off a knee injury to pass that conditioning test. It is not an easy thing. Somebody asked PJ, did you pass with flying colors? And he laughed. He goes, no, I did not pass with flying colors. I was lucky to pass. But the fact that he did pass, and Franklin said, Jair Brown was joking around interviewing Franklin at the podium with some of the Penn State camera people. And uh, Franklin w- was going along with it and joking around, but he was also serious and said, you know, Tig, the, the conditioning test for PJ to pass that conditioning test at 318 pounds is much different. And, and coming off of a knee injury is much, much different than you at 200 pounds passing, passing a conditioning test. So I think that was really big. The, the thing, and Daniel talked to PJ a bunch as well. But the thing that he said, uh, he's he is very confident that he's going to be 100 percent come Purdue opening on the road. uh, But he still has to get through camp. He still has to take those first hits. So the conditioning test, he said, was another box that he was able to check. And just one last thing. I'll go back to that 318 pounds. Uh, He's been up, I think, at 330 or over 330. So for him to be at 318, you know, that may sound like a lot, but he's a big framed guy and that's a good weight for him. Now, he obviously, you know, his conditioning will get better and better and better. But to be at that weight, I think is a positive for him. Yeah, Mark, Mark, he was 330 last year. And that was an important part of his offseason last year was packing on the pounds. I think he put went from about 310 or, or around 300 to that 330 mark. And we all wondered what he looked like. Well, he looked the best that he had at any point in his career. And we're talking about a top 100 prospect coming out of high school. Daniel, what kind of a vibe did you get from number 97? I, I know he is fired up to get on the field. So good luck to those interior offensive linemen for the Nittany Lions come next week. Yeah, PJ wanted to emphasize that his conditioning test was not modified either. Uh, it was it was the full conditioning test and, and he passed it. Um, but I spent a decent amount of time with him. I think it was about 15 minutes total. And we kind of got into some of the things about the rehab process and about coming back. And he was pretty candid that it was really, really hard uh, for him. He said he'd never been hurt, so he didn't really know what to expect. He said it got really difficult in late February and March in terms of, you know, having to do these things every day. Do you still want to do it? Uh, can you still kind of get through it? Um, and I thought that that was, you know, it's, it's kind of refreshing to hear, uh, you know, that the human side of things and, and what it was like to go through that. Um, he said that uh, Adisa Isaac really helped him through it. Um, Isaac was, was working back from his injury um, about the same time as PJ. He was a couple months ahead of him in the rehab process, but um, seeing Adisa get through it and seeing Adisa, you know, on the field, um, you, albeit in a limited capacity in the spring, it gave PJ kind of, okay, I can do this. I can get through it. Um, and that was something that that really helped him along in the process. But I think PJ is a great personality. He can really vacillate between being kind of goofy, talking about his big meal at St. Elmo, um, and then being really candid and, and really honest with, with what this process was, was like and, and getting through it and getting to this point. So, I mean, I think that he is a big part of the season. Um, as he goes, I think kind of the rest of that defensive line will go in terms of having a big guy inside who can take up a couple blockers, free up whoever's next to him, help free up the guys off the edge um, and just kind of go from there. So I think he's a foundational building block. Like you said, if things go differently last year, he's definitely in an NFL training camp and getting that kind of talent back on the defense for Manny Diaz for Penn State uh, is going to be really big this year. 
Hey, Tyler, yeah. just a couple yeah. just a couple other things that I wanted to mention is, is number one, building off what Daniel said. I think coming back was such a smart move for PJ. I mean, he would have gotten drafted, but I think he has a chance to make a lot of money. I mean, make a lot of money in the NFL. And I think he's the kind of guy who has a chance to be in the league for a decade plus, knock on wood, if he stays healthy. And once he's done, he, I think he's going to get into sports broadcasting and be very good at that. But I also wanted to point out, uh, you know, I know during the summer, a lot of people, maybe some people aren't on the site quite as much. But for anybody who hasn't been to our front page, we have a new look front page and it allows us to highlight some featured videos. And two of the videos that are on our front page now, one is PJ Mustafer. I would encourage everybody just to look at him talking about his rehab and get a feel for, for what he's like and how intelligent he is and, and how good he is about that stuff. And then right below that, uh, we have the, the part where we were asking Pat Kraft about the uh, about the the string of of Big Ten road openers, and you're going to get a really good feel for what Pat Kraft is all about. Uh, he doesn't he doesn't talk a ton about it, but you could see a sparkle in his eye and some some fire in his eye too. And you know, a previous video we had of Pat was was of him getting very emotional when they when they introduced him about you know getting this job and you know he nearly broke into tears this is a little bit different so i would encourage people i know a lot of people go straight to the message boards completely get that but go to that front page and check out a couple of those videos because i think those are two pretty pretty good ones in the sense of pj is a guy that that he really projects himself well all three of those guys did out in indy and then uh, get, get get a little bit of a, a feel for what pat craft's all about and you could see the, the kind of the again the, the, the twinkle in his eye the fire in his eye the kind of the spark the, the smile on his face when he's saying this stuff it was i thought it was pretty good a quick list for you guys pj mustafer adiza isaac hakeem beeman chop robinson deny dennis sutton none of them were involved in the Penn State defensive front for the bulk of Big Ten play last year. Essentially, none of them were. Now they all are, and uh, that's something. I'll tell you that much. For John Scott uh, up front and for Manny Diaz in this defense, that is quite the group of guys that all of a sudden you're reinserting or just you know for the first time uh, establishing them in the defensive rotation. A lot to sort through with those guys in August. We got to see where they are physically with some of them, uh, but exciting stuff as they get this this personnel plan together. By the way, one note: speaking of personnel plans, uh, something that popped up very quickly during James Franklin's availability out in Indianapolis, Ken Talley uh, confirmed to be joining the team during preseason camp. Uh, don't act, don't know it, when exactly he will be on campus and living with teammates and doing all that stuff. But uh, great news for a guy who is the last remaining freshman who has not yet joined uh, this roster to this point. Everyone else has been on board since either January or uh, May and June. Uh, no Ken Talley yet. He's a four-star edge rusher out of Philadelphia Northeast High School, a former teammate of Tyrese Mills, who just got to campus as a safety out of the junior college level. Uh, his former defensive coordinator, Dion Barnes, is an assistant with this Nittany Lions staff. So there's a lot of stuff in place that leads you to believe Ken Talley will be able to succeed. One thing really not in place is that experience on campus to this point so we'll see how he gets how he gets his feet wet where he lands in the field linebacker defensive end both part of that discussion as a recruit he was announced by the program as a linebacker back on signing day so we'll see how it shakes out but I thought that was a positive from James Franklin that he was willing to address it and willing to confirm that Ken Talley would be on campus you talked about PJ Mustafa returning and the impact there Jair Brown is a guy who was on the field throughout last year and, and did finish off on a high note in the Outback Bowl. And you almost wondered after that Outback Bowl, did he want to reconsider about declaring for the NFL draft because his stock was on the rise? Obviously, he stuck around. We talked so much about the takeaways he produced last year. Hell of a backstory. We've discussed it a lot on this podcast. What was the latest installment of his story like out in Indianapolis? It seemed to be a guy who was relishing the opportunity. Yeah, uh, Tig was someone who... I think he almost couldn't believe that he was there. Um, that was kind of the question that, that came up to him. Um, you know, hey, when you were at Lackawanna, did you ever think you would be here at Big Ten Media Days? He's wearing the nice suit uh, that the guys got through Adrian Amos. Um, and he just said, no, that you, you don't really think about these things. And I think he really enjoyed being there. Um, and, you know, he talked about his time at, at Lackawanna, um, his time living in Scranton and he looks back on it fondly. Um, he knows that it really shaped him and helped him get to this point. Um, and I think that he's really excited to kind of show what he can do uh, this year. I posted the video on Twitter and online 24-7 um, 
about when he was walking around with the microphone, uh, he was going to interview PJ Mustafer about his conditioning test. And before PJ got into that, PJ took the microphone and just talked about uh, Jair for about a minute in terms of the leadership and what it was like for PJ being on the sideline and getting to watch Brown kind of develop into that leader uh, to kind of step up and take on more of a role. And he talks about how, how proud he was of him and how that he thinks that this is really significant for the upcoming season. So I was, you know, Brown is one of those great personalities. Um, I think Penn state really kind of hit it out of the park with the guys they took to Indy this year. Uh, and he was really entertaining. And I think that, He's really looking forward to the season, had a lot of good things to say about the younger safeties, younger defensive backs back there. And I think he's raring to go and could be in for a big year. Yeah, I think Penn State was kind of lucky that uh, things worked out so well for Jaquan Brisker. Uh, obviously, another Lackawanna guy, you know, both of those guys went to Lackawanna College in, uh, in, uh, in Scranton before arriving at Penn State. Brisker decides to come back for his, uh, you know, fifth year or what, whatever, the, how, however you would call it for a Juco guy, but for his extra year when he probably would have been drafted in 21 ends up working out fantastic for him ends up being a second round draft pick. One of the highest DBs ever drafted. One of the went as high as just about any Penn state DB ever in the NFL draft. If I can spit that out the right way. And that worked out so well for him. And those guys had a relationship dating back a well-known for, for people who follow the, the, the team closely, well-known relationship between those two guys. They were a year, uh, uh, Tig was a year behind Brisker at Lackawanna, but things worked out so well that I think for Jair Brown, it was kind of a no brainer. Hey, let me follow that same path. And again, this is another one of those knock on wood that, 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 that he stays healthy. Um, I asked him, I said, are, are you aware that Penn State has never had a DB taken in the first round of the NFL draft? And he kind of smiled and he said, oh, yeah, I'm aware. Now, he wasn't going to get into talking about the NFL draft because, you know, the, the players, I think that's one of the things they warn them about there. Like, you know, talk about this season. Don't be looking ahead to that sort of thing. But he is well aware, and I really do believe that he has a chance to be that first guy because, listen, you know, he tied for the NCAA, NCAA lead in interceptions last year. You know, terrific in coverage. Uh, he was talking – somebody was asking about, you know, how do you develop a lot of those ball hawking skills? And he said, well, you can develop some of it, but some of it is just innate. And really, if you look at him, a lot of what he does, he just has a great feel for the game. He's really good in, 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 in run support as well. Uh, I think he's, uh, he's another guy that I think people are sleeping on. Um, Steve Hellwagon of the Ohio State 247 site did a preseason uh, poll of, of, the, of the publishers uh, on the network, the Big Ten publishers on the network. And uh, they asking who they thought the defensive player of the year would be. And, and I voted for him. I think he has an opportunity to do that because he's going to put up a bunch of picks if people are stupid enough to throw at him and he's going to put up a bunch of tackles. So I think he has an opportunity to do that. Willie, I don't know. I mean, there's a really good linebacker at Iowa who's probably going to post 8,000 tackles. But I think he has a chance to be that sort of player. Yeah, just to reiterate, no Division One offers, no Division Two offers coming out of uh, high school in Trenton. A, a remarkable upswing for, for his athletic career and a chance to really make that next leap going toward the NFL next year. We'll see what his last college campaign looks like. Another opportunity that Indianapolis or the Big Ten Media Days presents on an annual basis is to get face-to-face -face with some of the upcoming opponents for Penn State. And you don't have to look too far down the line when it comes to Big Ten action. Penn State opening on the road September 1st, a Thursday night, as we've addressed at Purdue. Um, Daniel, starting with you, uh, Jeff Brown was available, obviously, to speak about his program. Purdue players were out there. Um, this is one that they are gearing up for, and they're treating it uh, as a marquee moment for their program, potentially, with Penn State heading to town. Yeah, during his opening statement, Jeff Brom brought it up and said that it's something that they have to be ready for, uh, that they're that they're really going to hit the ground running. Um, and then I went through and I asked all the different Purdue players who were available about it, and they're really, really excited. They look at it as a big opportunity on national television um, with what should be a packed house at ross Aid Stadium to really make a statement about their program and how far they've come. Um, I asked Aiden O'Connell about the last time Penn State and Purdue played in 2019, and 
he said that that was actually his uh, his college football debut. I think he had completed one pass for four yards in, in mop up duty. Um, and he said that it's a chance to kind of show how far uh, Purdue has come as a program and and to really make a statement um, in in that environment. So I think the Boilermakers are going to be ready for it. Um, you know, we didn't really expect anything else uh, from them when when you look at kind of the the landscape of the schedule. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun uh, five weeks from yesterday. And it's just getting closer every single day. Mark, uh, storyline as well is the Minnesota matchup that looms in October. I know some people were up in arms that this is the whiteout pick. But when you start to parse through it, it, it really is a very compelling matchup. And I'll throw this to both of you. Kirk Shiraka, he's back in Minneapolis 2020, we keep saying it's hard to pin too much of what happened in 2020 on James Franklin, on Penn State football. We've kind of said that a lot. So I think that you have to attribute that to the offensive coordinator who didn't get to work with his offense until late September. Um, I don't know what to make of Kirk Shiraka's 2020. I do know that a lot of the numbers on paper look better in 2020 versus 2021. And I do know that if him and Tanner Morgan get rolling again, this could be an extremely compelling matchup in late October. Both of these quarterbacks, six-year guys, uh, they've played strong football at times, but they're not coming off of, of high-quality football in 2021. What do you make of this matchup as you got a little bit more uh, evidence of its importance from the other side? Yeah, for, from my perspective, um, it, it, before getting into the the Shiraka part of it, I had a chance to ask uh, several of the players, Mariano Sorimar and, and uh, Tyler Newbin, uh, two of their, their better defensive players, about – you know, playing in a whiteout, and, and both of those guys were genuinely, I mean, like they're honored to to, to be playing in that sort of atmosphere. Uh, Sorry, Martin called it a uh, a bucket list type of game, and PJ Fleck was kind of the same way. It's like you know, this is the stuff you dream of. Uh, now I don't know if they'll be dreaming of that <laughs> when there's 107 thousand people in the stands. Uh, but but I thought I thought that was pretty cool that that that, that was some of the, some of the things they said, you know. In talking to people who cover Minnesota, you know, they're talking about how motivated Minnesota is and how motivated Chirac is. I, I don't doubt that for one iota of a. I don't doubt that for a fraction of a second at all. But I think Penn State might be a little bit motivated too after the way things went down after that last game when you know they were celebrating like crazy. And I'm not blaming the Minnesota people for celebrating but if you're on the other end of that that's something that sticks in your head so all those things together i agree with you tyler i think the more i think about this you know would it be would it have been more interesting if it were ohio state you know sure but there are some compelling elements to this game um some really cool storylines and there is a little bit of a rivalry built here again nothing remotely close to penn state ohio state but there are some cool storylines, and and uh, it, it's it's a better situation than I initially thought. As you think it through, and as you talk to the different people, especially on the Minnesota side, Daniel, you also were out there uh, speaking about Kirk Shiraka, and 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 I I do I am wondering, I guess, on on the Kirk Shiraka angle. Um, is there, was there kind of a breaking of the ice, even though he was familiar with the head coach out there, even though his quarterback was still around, he did bolt on the team before their bowl game after their most successful season in modern history and, and, and ended up down at the cotton bowl watching Penn state play ball. So was there kind of something that needed to be readdressed up in Minneapolis before things were, were back to normal per se? PJ Fleck said that when he was interviewing Kirk, talking to Kirk about coming back, that Shiraka asked him, are the players going to be okay with this? And Fleck said, you might have to answer some questions that might be a little awkward within that, you know, the first five minutes of that first team meeting. Um, and he said that he did that. And after that, it's been kind of, uh, you know, business as usual. Um, I talked to the center uh, from Minnesota, John Michael Schmitz, I believe, um, for a while about it. And he said that, Shiraka came in, kind of explained his side. Everyone kind of broke bread, and then they moved on. Um, I also asked him uh, whether or not he he thinks that uh, Shiraka will be pretty motivated for this game, and he didn't quite take the bait. Uh, he, you know, he felt like he was about to say say something. He got a big smile on his face, and then he just kind of went back to one game at a time. Every game is the is the the biggest game on the schedule, and that's all he'll say about that. But I think this game will, will have some juice. Um, I'm looking forward to it. It's between 
Michigan and Ohio State. Uh, so it might get a little bit lost uh, in the grand scheme of things, but I don't think uh, either side uh, will be will be looking past that night in Happy Valley. Well, Daniel, Mark, thank you very much for your coverage out in Indy. Thanks for, for uh, holding things together with camp coverage on Friday along with Tyler. Uh, we'll talk to you real soon on the podcast, and, and I'll be doing the best I can here from the infirmary ward. Go get some rest. All right, will do. Thanks, guys. This has been the Lions 24-7 podcast, coverage of Lash Bash, coverage of the final prospect camp on this weekend, lions247.com. Head over there. VIP subscribers are already well in the know on which top prospects are supposed to be on campus. For now, stepping aside, I'm Tyler Donahue. We're back next week. And Penn State back on the practice field with training camp.